Our Old Testament reading for this morning is Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Now hear the word of the Lord. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It is such a pleasure and privilege to worship with you today. And I bring you greetings from Naperville Presbyterian Church. Uh, we at NPC are so glad you exist um, as our gospel allies nine minutes down the road, according to Google Maps, as we all really work and long for and pray for what only God can do in our own ordinary, messy little lives, and in Naperville. So what a joy. Thanks for letting me be here. Uh, let's begin with prayer. Our Father, you say, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. You say, call to me, and I will answer you. You say, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. You say that your word is living and active and more precious than much fine gold. So we simply come to you directly now in your word, tired of our sin, exhausted with life, weak in faith, weighed down by many anxieties, haunted by shame, perhaps some of us, and we take all our weakness and failure and sin and dump it in your lap, opening your book to hear once more about your son, whose embrace outstrips our guilt, whose strength is perfected in our weakness, and whose friendship never fails. So we together ask you to come by your Spirit and astonish us with the unspeakable treasure of the Scripture on which this church is so clearly founded and to which our text today drives us afresh. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. You've heard Psalm 1 read. If you don't have it open, please do so now. Psalm 1. And the question that this text really confronts us with and surprises us with the way it answers it is simply, how in the world do you flourish in life? Flourish. Blossom, become fruitful, become a life spreading rather than a life sucking kind of person? How do you become solid? How do you live a life of eternal significance, one that will matter when you're gone? Really, how, how do you get joy would be one way to ask it. That's really what this word blessed means here in the psalm, the very first word, both in English and in the Hebrew text, of the whole book of Psalms. Blessed is the man. It's a word that doesn't, it really means happy. There's actually another Hebrew word that is used hundreds of times, which is translated bless or blessing. This is a word that is used a couple of dozen times in the Old Testament, and it really means the happiness of, that kind of blessedness. In Genesis 30, uh, Leah gives birth to a son, and she says, happy 
am I? And the text says, so she called his name Asher, which is the very word used here in Psalm 1, Asherah, blessed, happy. But it doesn't mean jokingly or frothily happy, as if the more stand-up comedy you take in, the happier you are. It means weightily happy. One Christian writer puts it this way, there's a kind of happiness and wonder that makes you serious. It is too good to waste on jokes. That kind of happy. Really, to become human again, to flourish. It's what we all long for. I'm after it. So are you. Is what so much of our energy in life is quietly pursuing, what we're looking for when we want to make money or get well-known or make it big or have incredible kids or marry an impressive person or get discovered at work. And true human flourishing, flourishing, it turns out, comes in a really surprising way. A way that we would probably never have guessed if God hadn't told us. And he tells us throughout the scripture, and maybe nowhere clearer than Psalm 1, which is really the nuclear core to living the Christian life, to which everything else is garnish. So the way we'll work through the text is simply taking it verse by verse, nothing cute and clever, just feeding together on the scripture here. This is a great psalm. Do we ever graduate beyond the need for Psalm 1? What a text. Here are my three points. They just come right out of the text, okay? The secret to flourishing. How do you get it? Secondly, the tragedy of missing it. And thirdly, zooming out and really reading Psalm 1 in light of the whole Bible, uh, the surprising accomplishing of human flourishing. The secret to it, the tragic, the tragedy of missing it and the surprising accomplishing of it. So let's see what we find here. What's the secret to flourishing? Friends, it's impossible to go through life neutral, uninfluenced. We're all chameleons. We become like our environment, wherever you're hanging out. Or, or to make it even a little closer to the text, not only your environment, what you're around and what's outside of you, but what you take in. We become like what we take in. You can take in healthy food and become vigorous and strong, or you can take in junk food all week long and become weak and sick, so spiritually. You can take in what is healthy and gives life, or what is unhealthy and brings death. And that's really what we have in the first two verses there, as you have your scripture open, verse one, is talking about not taking in what's unhealthy. And verse 2, taking in what is. Verse 1, blessed is the man, ashray, happy, solidly happy, is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of, it doesn't mean blocking, it means standing in the path of, along with sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You can see the progression there. Walks, stands, sits to communicate what? The grinding meltdown of your flourishing when you surround yourself with stupidity, folly, smallness of thought and heart. People who scoff, who ridicule, who are cynical, who are always sort of, you know, snorting at everything under their breath, who look at life and see an endless series of opportunities to smirk. You spend time with the cynical and it lowers the ceiling, the psalmist is saying, on your own capacity to flourish. And you eventually, though probably imperceptibly to yourself, become like that. Verse 2 gives the alternate to the folly of verse 1, but it's interesting, the psalmist doesn't say, but he walks in the counsel of the wise. 
and stands in the way of the righteous and sits in the seat of, I don't know, encouragers or something like that. He does not give the exact photo negative in verse 2 to what he has said in verse 1. The psalmist's alternative to horizontal folly, hanging out with people who diminish your capacity to flourish, isn't hang out with better people. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Would you ever have expected God to say that to you if you didn't have Psalm 1? Don't hang out with this kind of person. Instead, hang out with your Bible. If you want to live a life of flourishing, true flourishing, don't go to people. Now, as one of my old seminary profs used to say, don't hear what I'm not saying. Go to people for wisdom. I mean, what, what, I'm an introvert, so I like being alone, but I get lonely too, because I'm also made in the image of God. This is not an extrovert, introvert thing. We all need people, friends, social reality, getting life from other people. It's a wonderful thing. People are a great blessing. These are some of my richest joys in life, these four humans down here, and two others somewhere. But you cannot count on people, even wonderful people, to be the source of your flourishing. If you do, you'll die a hollow, shallow, disillusioned person. People can't bear that weight. They will let you down. But you will flourish to the degree you draw strength from, delight in God. Now, how do you do that? That's all this text is about. How do, in the world do you do that? Here's how you do it. You take a straw and you stick it in a Bible and you start sipping and you don't stop till you're dead. You put on the headphones of the Bible and press play and don't press stop your whole life long. You inhale Bible and, to use the picture of this psalm, exhale fruitfulness. You become solidly happy. Look at the text there, verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He delights in the scripture. Wow. He doesn't just study it, learn about it, read it, and I'm all for study of the Bible. But he more deeply delights in the scripture, in the law, the text says. Understand, this doesn't mean narrowly the law, like God's, what he tells us to do, the narrow understanding of God's commands. Sometimes the Bible uses law to speak of what God has told us to do, but more broadly, it's the Hebrew word Torah, more broadly, God's whole entire communication to us, his instruction to us, what he has said to us. For us today, the scripture, his delight is in the law. Really, what this is talking about, friends, is simply opening yourself up. You know, in Proverbs, the key defining common theme of the fool is not, it's not about IQ. It's someone who is always deflecting what God and other wise people say because they always know best. The wise person is the one who's able to actually, it, uh, counsel from God and others sinks in and they hear it. That's what this is talking about, opening yourself up to counsel from heaven. And not just reading it, the text says meditating on it. That doesn't mean like Eastern meditation. Mm, that's actually the opposite where you try to empty your brain that's not the kind of meditate here. The Hebrew word means something like musing or even muttering. I was telling Zach on the way over here, I was chuckling because I remember golfing with a friend of mine four or five years ago, right down here at Arrowhead. And um, we were having a discussion about a, an issue, a theological hot topic. And um, this is a, a, an older gentleman who was a teacher of mine who is just filled with the Bible. And he walked up to one of the tees, and he's kind of getting ready to hit the ball, and he's muttering Bible. 
It's just bubbling up out of him. That's the kind of meditate, musing, muttering. It's always there. It is your primary influence. It's not peripheral to your mental horizon, but central. It actually affects you and the way you think and act and behave. It's the loudest voice in your life, you might say. Do you, I want to ask you all something, if I may be so bold, just very gently but directly, do you delight in Scripture? That's a bracing question, isn't it? Do you delight in it, or are you just bored? Uh, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. Uh, That's never the job of a preacher, especially not a guest preacher. I'm just trying to ask you the question that we are confronted with in this vital, basic, fundamental six verses in the Bible. Do you want to flourish? Do you want to be a solid radiant, calm, attractive, spiritually, man or woman? If so, step away from cynical influences towards God in the Bible. What happens when you do? Verse 3, he is like a tree. Don't you love the earthiness of the scripture? It's not philosophical, ethereal, just, you know, abstractions. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Not immediate. The word you could translate it in its time. At the appropriate, it's like making an investment and then you bear the fruit. And its leaf does not wither. The leaf, in other words, goes through the seasons and it will at some point fall off, but it grows back. It never finally is destroyed. In all that he does, he prospers. In other words, guys, flourish. Isn't this flourishing? That's what we're talking about. To walk through the wide wilderness of this world without drinking in, inhaling scripture is like being a tree dropped out of an airplane into the middle of the Sahara. It might have been healthy, but once it's in the middle of a desert, It doesn't have a chance of surviving. It will be dried up, fruitless, withered, doing no good, bearing no fruit for anyone. But to walk through this world drinking down, inhaling scripture is like being a tree planted next to a river. And actually, this is pretty striking if you were to translate this phrase real woodenly and literally. The preposition used here that the ESV understandably translates by streams of water is most often in the Hebrew Old Testament translated on or upon. It's a flexible preposition, so I don't want to drive this too hard, okay? But you could get an image here like this. There's a tree, and it isn't just next to the river. It is right on top of it, drinking up those delicious nutrients and fruit blossoming out. Prospers here, of course, doesn't mean material prospering. Who cares about that? That's external to you. That doesn't give you joy. It's a a kind of internal vitality that animates and colors all that you do. You can see this on people. And all that they do, they prosper. They might be in pain, in deep adversity and suffering, but there is a deeper kind of prospering of heart because they're like a tree on the river of the Bible. But not all see the word of God, the instruction of heaven, vertical counsel that way. The text continues and tells us about the tragedy of missing this. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, they're not like that tree, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Are you familiar with this language of chaff? We don't really talk about chaff today. What it is is the little husk of grain 
um, or some other seed that's left over after you remove the part that you want. And so it's extremely light and breakable and worthless, and the slightest breeze just blows it away, and it does no good to anyone. So consider the contrast. You see the contrast in this psalm. It is vivid. Over on one side, you have this tree on a river, lush. You know, they say that trees, as high and wide as the branches go, so deep and wide go the roots of most trees. You just can't see it. It's rooted in this river, and it's bearing fruit. The fruit is coming out. It's delicious. It's green. It's healthy. It's attractive. You want to paint a picture of it, put a photo of it on your wall. On the one hand, and on the other hand, a little, mostly transparent chaff, which just blows away at the slightest breeze. Therefore, verse 5, if you're mere chaff, the wicked will not stand, you could translate that stand up even, will not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The idea here, friends, is that those who close off their ears to God's voice in Scripture, like the Proverbs fool. They deflect it. It just pings off of them, which is how we all are naturally hardwired from birth, and it takes a lifetime to begin to step out of that, are descending into, if you are settled and hardened in that way of being, and you cannot receive vertical counsel, here's what the text is saying. You're descending, such a person is descending into eternal insignificance, like chaff to be blown away. They can't even stand in the midst of the people of God. They're tiny. They may loom large now on cable news. They may dominate the headlines. They may make all the money. They may live in the biggest homes. They may get all the attention. But if they continue on in their God-ignoring, wisdom-deflecting course, They are melting into the tragedy of eternal inconsequentiality. That's why the last line of verse 6 there speaks of the way of the wicked perishing. It's a Hebrew word that means the path, the road on which you travel. Not only will the wicked physically perish, but their whole course of life will drop away, and they will have contributed nothing. My favorite Old Testament commentator is a man named Derek Kidner, and in his commentary on... Uh, the Psalms, he uses the following three-word phrase to describe what the text is is talking about here. Collapse and expulsion. Falling away into nothingness. Uh, In Lewis's The Great Divorce, which I don't commend down to every jot and tittle theologically. Okay? It's a little bit of an odd book, and he's not trying to say, here's what heaven and hell look like in every detail, but it is a profound depiction of the way we resist joy. And he has a group of people take a bus ride from hell to heaven, condemned people to talk with glorified people. And it's a perfect description of the solidity of the one who is founded on a river, and is like a tree, and the wispiness of a chaff-like person. Because the condemned people can't, they're so wispy and ephemeral and non-solid, they can't even stand on the grass. It's like spikes on their feet. The grass is more substantial than them. They can't pick up an apple. It's too heavy for them. It's like picking up a really heavy bowling ball. If they step onto a river, they're just dragged down along the top of it. They can't penetrate it. They're so non-solid. And this psalm is saying there's a way out of that into true, solid, flourishing. Verse 6 then sums up the whole psalm. Uh, We've been hearing about the righteous in verses 1 through 3, and then the wicked in verses 4 and 5, and those are the two categories picked up in this final verse, summarizing the whole psalm. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The key word in that verse is knows. 
The Lord knows the way of the righteous. What does that mean? It can't be simply cerebral cognitive knowledge. Because in, like, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Because in that sense, God knows the way, the destiny, the pathway of the wicked just as well. It means something different. Actually, it, if you've read through the Old Testament, you've noticed the way it speaks of God knowing his people in a special way, it's covenantal language. In other words, it has to do with the special way God cares for his people. Actually knows in the Old Testament, including here, isn't that far different from loves, looks after, cares for, bound himself to. It's a word, of course, knows that's used of the, the very special intimacy of a husband and wife. What is 6a saying when it says God knows the way of the righteous? All it's saying is God cares for his children all the way into eternal, solid stability. Notice the surrounding contrast. Verse 4, uh, the wicked are like chaff that the wind drives away, transient, ephemeral. Verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They'll get swept away. Verse 6, uh, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. They're cast out into judgment and insignificance, which raises the question, how do you know? How do you know that God will love and know you into eternal stability, a stable future. How do you know at the end of the day? Because we're all up and down and all over the place. How do you know for sure that you are a Psalm 16a person and not a Psalm 16b person? How do you know you're a tree and not chaff? How can we be sure that our way is known to God? Well, let me answer that question by asking another question. Actually, Andrew, you said in the first phrase of your vision as a church, it's to see Christ preached from all the scriptures. Let me ask you a question and wrestle with it for five seconds. What do you do with Psalm 1? How do you do that with Psalm 1? Because I'm using the ESV like you are, and I don't see J-E-S-U-S -S anywhere in the psalm. But of course, as you know, Jesus himself, the risen Christ, had a Bible study at the very end of Luke with his disciples, where he said, everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms, a threefold way of speaking about the whole Old Testament, must be fulfilled. So let's just close very briefly here, you all, by asking the question, how does Psalm 1 fit into that? And I'm moving now into the surprising accomplishing of true flourishing. Now there are different ways we could uh, tackle this here, uh, different valid ways, and here's one way to step into this. Uh, Graham Goldsworthy, is a, a biblical writer and theologian who has really helped me to put the whole Bible together. And in a couple of his books, he puts it like this. If you preach or teach an Old Testament text and you could have done so in a Jewish synagogue and not gotten thrown out, then you haven't preached or taught it in a Luke 24 first clause of your vision statement kind of way. In other words, everything I've said so far basically could be happily received by those who do not accept the New Testament and the giving of Christ as the fulfillment to it in a Jewish synagogue. So how does Christ come in here? Well, let's say you've lived a long life of true flourishing. Let's say you've really done well by the grace of God. And you have, um, you've taken your counsel from God. You've been the wise person, not the fool. You've walked with integrity. Sure, with ups and downs, but you've ge generally walked faithfully. Uh, if so, you will have lived a blessed, in the meaning of the psalm, blessed, happy, solid, fruitful life. 
But when you die and stand before God and are asked the question that we were asked in the story earlier, heard asked, uh, will God say, well done, good and faithful servant, you have done Psalm 1, therefore by the merits of your faithfulness, come on in. No, that's really bad theology. That's not the gospel. If our entrance into heaven is based on our performance, one little hundredth of a percent, all is lost, and we can't have any assurance, and there's no hope. Even our performance of healthy and wise and biblical instruction, even the best of us, is utterly without hope, if that's in part what it is based on. Handley Mool, the Old New Testament scholar, says this, the harlot, the liar, the murderer are short of the glory of God, but so are you. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine and you on the crest of an alp, but you are as little able to touch the stars as they. At the end of the day, we're all in the same predicament, but what if you could go through life knowing your own spiritual flourishing is not finally what gets you into heaven. You know, you could actually enjoy the Christian life. What if someone on our behalf lived Psalm 1 perfectly and then transferred over to us the reward of that perfect life lived. Take the language of the psalm. What if someone truly, truly never walked in the counsel of the wicked or stood in the way of sinners or sat in the seat of scoffers? Ever. Even a little. But was treated at the end of his life as if he had. What if someone yielded fruit and prospered if anyone was ever fruitful? and truly deserved to stand, to rise in the judgment, verse 5, and to live in the congregation of the righteous. But instead, he willingly descended into insignificance and non-substantiality, despising the shame. What if he deserved a throne, but instead took a cross, so that you and I, naturally fools, deserving a cross, could be given a throne. That is what Jesus Christ did. So, delight in Scripture, meditate and muse on it, let it be the loudest voice, never take the headphones off, befriend it, for in it you will be walked into true flourishing, the solid happiness of one who lives on inhales God's own words, and especially his word of total forgiveness and endless embrace, won for us at the cost of his own son, dear son's life. The Lord Jesus, whom we love and adore, and in whose matchless name may we now close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to walk us ever more deeply into your word by your spirit as those united invincibly to your son, spreading the fragrance of heaven wherever we go, fruitful, fruitful, prospering, really prospering, alive, as those lovingly known, known by you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.